Yeah, so as Holger uh, said, uh, my name is uh, Ian Howarth, and um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a photographer. And I just want to kind of preface by saying that, you know, as I go along, if you have any questions at all, like, please interrupt me, because I think at some point I'm going to lose my mind, because this is my first time actually speaking in front of a large group of people, largest group of people at least. So if you do have any questions, please ask, because uh, it will allow me at least to refocus something if I'm kind of like trailing off a little bit. So please, by all means, do. Um, so yeah, so my name is Ian, I'm a, I'm a photographer, um, and my background has been video for quite some time, I think probably for the last seven years. And I kind of started out kind of doing little projects for myself. I used to kind of go out mountain biking and like film myself kind of like riding and stuff. And I don't know why I did that. I think I just kind of enjoyed mountain biking and I loved video. So I just thought, how can we put those two things together? So um, I used to go out with a friend and we just, just video each other. And we would kind of piece it together, and I think that kind of like for me really kind of began my journey into kind of visuals, basically. Um, so kind of through that, I kind of decided that you know it was a possibility that I could potentially do this professionally, you know, if I worked hard enough and did the right things or whatever. So it just kind of carried on. Um, but to cut to cut a long story short, because I don't want to give you my whole life story, I think we're going to talk about photography as well. Um, I just became a little bit jaded with kind of. Um, I guess doing video work um, or certain types of video work you know I think I think even now I kind of see myself as a as a kind of failed cinematographer or DP I guess um, in that you know I haven't become like not a Hollywood cinematographer but I think that is basically the zenith I think of what I would like to do um, so I think I kind of slowly began to kind of do more photography as I found that I was able to control a lot more as to what I wanted to do rather than have to basically be someone else's tool for a job. So a director or a writer or something. This allowed me to have complete control over the images that I wanted to create. And, and also I realized very early on that um, I wasn't necessarily a writer or a director or, or anything like that. You know, I found it, I find it difficult just because of the way that I am that maybe I'm not very good at kind of like coming up with large storylines that require kind of a lot of prep, you know, I'm, I'm kind of more visual led and then I work from that kind of thing. Um, so, um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll start at the beginning. Um, and I think this image here is, I think, it's not taken at the beginning of my kind of journey, but I think it's, I think for me, it kind of reminds me of a time where I was very much kind of very in, very much into cinematography. Um, and photography and I was very confused as to what I wanted to do. So this kind of encompasses that, that time, which wasn't actually very long ago at all. And that person there is my long-suffering girlfriend, Emily, who's at the back of the room. Um, who's always been the, the source of, um, well, not the source of frustration, I'm sure I'm the source of her frustration many, <laughs> many, many times for, for having to stand her in bus stops in November in weird parts of town to get her to pose for me. But, Around this time, I was very much, um, I think, influenced by Gregory Crutzen. I don't know how many of you know Gregory Crutzen here, but Gregory Crutzen is someone who's very well known for, you know, basically creating very cinematic pieces. So if you imagine a film that's beautifully shot, he basically recreates a film frame by frame. So he just gets an idea into his head and he tries to almost imagine a whole film into one frame or one emotion into one frame. And he'll spend, you know, upwards of you know, half a million dollars on one single frame. So you see the shot kind of get all set up and he just goes, whack, and that's it. Shut, shutter fires and that's it, shoots over, and that's a half a million pounds. And obviously he sells each print for, you know, a quarter of a million or half a million, so. But it was around this time that I was kind of very much influenced by him and, um, you know, his work is very much punctuated by kind of really well-lit scenes where, you know, all the light areas are well exposed and equally there's a bit of detail in, in the shadows and stuff so which I think is what people understand as cinematic you know is having detail everywhere you know and I think that's kind of what I wanted to create effectively um, and he, he actually saw this piece and he actually liked it and I was fortunate enough to actually get a signed copy of his book in which I was you know I, was, I think that was a highlight of, of last year for me um, but I think this for me is like it's almost like like a bookmark for me. This is when I really became kind of like serious about what I wanted to do, you know, and I think, I think this image really reminds me of that. So the first few images are basically work from the last kind of maybe two or three years, I would say. Um, and these are all digital images. Um, 
So this next image is again of uh, my girlfriend Emily, and she sniggers in the background. Um, and again, it was maybe I think around this time I wasn't, you know, too influenced by Gregory Crutzen. Um, but again, because of my background and wanting to be a cinematographer, I was very much kind of keen on this look, you know, um, and it's learning about light. And I think for me, that's kind of been my my biggest love affair, I guess, with with, with visuals is understanding light as much as possible and you know how, how that works in creating mood um, and I'm not really sure as to what mood I wanted here I just kind of felt it and I think Emily just stood in for me and she was kind of like posing a little bit and not she wasn't moving around too much but it was kind of like once she did it I knew that that was it and that's pretty much the frame the frame that I captured and I think I did that kind of quite a lot of times um, I think maybe we visited this spot maybe two or three times until I was actually happy with the final image um, and I'll stand up for this bit. But um, I think what's very different to the work that I do now is that this image is heavily, heavily edited. Um, so basically, what you can't see here is that there was actually a whole bunch of tungsten lights, like, uh, like loads of it. Um, this is a park, and it's kind of the center of the neighborhood, so everything is kind of tungsten lit all around. And I basically spent probably upwards of two days getting rid of every single source in the background, but making it look in a believable way. Um, and, and again, I think this image represents kind of like, I think now certainly, a move away from wanting to do this type of thing where it was like, I wasn't sure as to where the line was between photography and digital manipulation. Um, and I think I didn't want to do too much digital manipulation. I wanted to be, I guess, a photographer. Pure way, so I think this image really kind of reminds me of that. And aside from that, the image is pretty much as it as I took it, but I think just that there it was pretty much just all tungsten and oranges, and I just spent an age trying to touch everything up. And I think there was like a no no dog fouling sign on that that I had to get rid of. Um, but hey, you know, that's, that's the way it goes. Um, so I'll move on to the next image, and again, Emily, yet again. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to say too much about this one. Um, I think it's around a similar time, again. Um, again, a very cinematic kind of piece. Um, I wanted to kind of have detail kind of in certain areas. Um, as kind of, that's kind of what I, I don't know, I was influenced by at the time. But I equally knowing that I was kind of cheating it in many ways. You know, I wasn't necessarily lighting something. Um, I mean, in other words, a cinematographer never sets up for a scene and thinks I'm going to remove this, I'm going to remove that. They make it so that when they shoot it, it's right. Whereas I don't have that luxury, you know, I can't say to the council, can you remove this bin or whatever. So I know in my head I've got to do it and then sort it out in post, you know. So uh, this one didn't require too much, I think. I think maybe I removed like a bin from here maybe, possibly. Um, but I think aside from that, I think I just upped the highlights maybe slightly. But I think aside from that, it was pretty much um, as is. But I wanted like an urban feel to this, so that's why Emily kind of looks like a naughty lad from the back, I guess, you know, because she's got the hood up and that's that kind of attitude to a gate, I think. Um, that's kind of the vibe that I wanted there. Um, so yeah, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, not much to say about this one, so I'll skip that one. Um, I think this image here, um, I think is, I think it's kind of a bit of a turning point for me because it's an image that I've come back to um, quite a lot. Uh, this is just a candid shot that I took at Lewis Bonfire about three years ago. And um, I remember kind of looking at the image um, later on and just seeing kind of like quite a lot of grain here. And this is a digital shot, so it's actually quite a lot of noise, digital noise. And I think around the time I was pretty much rejecting digital noise, I was like, noise is awful, you know, and I'm sure many of you, I don't know if you've ever looked at cameras and, and reviews on cameras, digital noise is bad, you know, so high ISOs and all that, you know, it's like clean image and all that, so this image represented kind of what's not good about digital photography at night, you know, a very noisy image, but I think for me, it kind of like, it had so much mood that I was kind of happy with the imperfections on the image, you know, and I, and I, and I kept it, and it's something that I've used, and and certainly when anyone's asked me for images, I've still included in that, even though it's kind of very old work for me. It's an image that for me just reminds me of a time where, I wouldn't say I went anti-digital, but it was more like I began to kind of embrace the imperfections within 
um, image making and being quite happy with it. Um, so yeah, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, um, Emily, yet again. Um, and this is one of the last kind of digital images that I took, uh, in fact. I mean, I've taken some since then, um, but this is one of the last few that I remember kind of still being excited um, about taking my digital camera out. Um, and I think me and Emily were about to go to, um, to Peru on a trip, and it was one of the last outings that we had before that trip and um, it's an image that I still very very much like but it just very much reminds me um, of just a certain look and a certain aesthetic that I kind of have for, that I basically followed on for, for quite some time and I think with, with this one I just wanted something I don't know I guess um, quite sci-fi um, but at the same time almost like sci-fi but with 60s vibes almost like a almost like a, a sci-fi film from the 60s so you still have those kind of like kind of yellowy canary yellow and kind of baby blue palettes kind of within within the frame. Um, but yeah, I mean again it's still an image that I, I, I very I very much very much still like. Okay, back to that one again. Um, so I'll see if I can actually find um, something a bit more contemporary for you. <clears throat> oh not there. Okay, so I'm fast forwarding quite a bit now. This is kind of more kind of present day um, and pretty recent. So, and then I'll dip into the transitional period from one to the other. Um, but I think it's quite kind of relevant to talk about this, I guess. So this is basically what I'm doing now. Um, and this is kind of part of my big focus. So I'll begin with this. So, it doesn't look like much, does it? Um, so basically, um, this is an image um, that I took about, I think coming on for a year, a year now, and I was shooting a wedding in Lewis, and I just got off the bus, and I needed somewhere to go to the toilet, and this is the first place I found. And I saw it, and I just happened to have my, my film camera with me, and I just saw that corner, and I just completely fell in love with it. Um, I'm not sure why, um, I just saw it and I just loved it. I loved the light, I loved the fact that it's very unusual, um, the textures as well. Um, I just liked everything about it. And I remember looking at this image and just very much liking it, but then I found that it was very subjective to me. You know, like I remember I was tired and I saw it and I was very excited, not just to find someone to go for a pee. Um, but obviously like the fact that I needed that and I actually found something else completely and it was that but I, I found that it didn't have any it didn't have enough to, to have it as a usable image I think it needed something else and I kind of sat on it for a while and I thought about it a lot then I would stop thinking about it I thought about it a lot um, and then um, and then just through circumstance and doing different things, I decided that it was actually the perfect place for a project, but it just took a long, long, long time to actually get there. Um, and it was around this time that I decided that I wanted to shoot more with people. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, I think I just emotionally connect with people, um, or I think with people in my images more than just an image of something or a thing. I think if you can convey some kind of emotion in a shot, and combine it with a strong visual, I think it aids a lot more um, to the image. So, fast forward about 10 months from this image, um, which um, was inspirational but incredibly frustrating, um, to, let me find it, to this. So, this was about 10 months later, so I think I shot this in February. Um, and this was shot on film, um, specifically it was shot on medium format film. Um, and I think from here I can actually talk a bit more about my transition from digital to film and kind of why that happened. Um, so, when I was talking about the shot in Lewis of all the people's heads with the fire in the background, I kind of realised that I didn't really mind kind of having um, imperfections in my shot. I think so long as they aided towards the emotion of it, I think I was quite happy. And I kind of realized that um, it didn't really matter too much about the technology or, you know, 
high ISOs or clean images or sharpness, these things just quite naturally began to matter less and less to me. Um, to the point that now, I think so long as I can actually get the image that I want, I don't really care as to what equipment I'm using. Um, so I kind of decided also around that time that when I was going out with my digital camera, I was shooting far too much. Um, so I was going out and taking 300 frames of something and coming back and having six usable images. And I wasn't sure as to why that was. I mean, I think since then I've spoken to a lot of people who say that they treat digital cameras much in the same way that I would treat a film camera. So they will go out and be almost very strict with themselves. They'll look through the viewfinder, look at something and go, no. So they'll, they'll take it up and go, no, I'm not taking that. And they'll just walk on. Whereas what I was doing, I was doing the exact same thing, doubting and still firing the shutter. In fact, I would probably fire it 10 more times, you know, so just, just to be sure that I got the shot. And in the end, you know, I'll go back home and I would have nothing that I wanted to use. Um, so I, I kind of found that a little bit kind of frustrating. And just through a stroke of luck, a friend of mine gave me a film camera just to, um, to keep for him while he was away. And when I went to Peru, I decided to use this camera and it became quite freeing for me. Um, I, found, I found that the slowing down process of shooting film uh, just really suited me. Um, and I began to find that a lot of the shots that I was taking, I was finding more and more keepers. So, whereas I would have 300 exposures on a digital camera, which maybe five were usable, with film I was finding I could actually maybe use half the roll because I was slowing down so much more. So I would shoot less, but I would have more usable. So the ratio was actually more favorable. Um, so that was kind of my transition to, um, to, to film. Um, and when it came to big setups like this, I did have a lot of doubt as to whether or not I should shoot things like this on, on, on digital or not. Um, simply because even though this is not, it looks like it's lit, it's actually all natural light. So um, I think the only light source is coming from here. I'm just hitting that, I'm also creating that, and I think it's lit from the other side. So the other side I think is identical. So that kind of creates that kind of like light on her face. So it still had to be metered, um, you know, with a light meter, so in a kind of cinematographic style. Um, but um, at the same time, it, it, it does require a bit more time to set up. You know, you can't just turn up, whack, check, whack, check. You know, it was very much like a very, very slow process in getting to that point. Um, but by no means do I want to sell it as being something that I just showed up and took one shot and I was happy and that's the end result, you know, so um, something that I wouldn't do normally is I would, I mean, and by the way guys, this is, this is probably half of the shots that I took. <laughs> I actually, I probably ended up taking about maybe three rolls worth. Yeah, so I'm not proud of that. Um, it's, by no, it's by no means something that I would share with absolutely everybody. Um, but I, I just thought it's, 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 it's real. I mean, me not telling you about it does not make it real, does not, not make it real. So this is just how it was. So I basically took um, my medium format camera and I took my 35 mm camera. And that was just for safety more than anything because I was so taken by this place. Sorry, I'm, I'm just showing you a folder here. Um, I'll actually take you onto an image which is actually completely different. So this is the black and white version. Um, and I basically had two shots left on a black and white film, and I just took them of this, um, knowing that I was going to shoot color, obviously. Um, so I just took them, and it was done. And actually, if I'm completely honest with myself, she actually gave me the best expression um, when I actually took this shot. Um, which is a shame that it happened to, didn't happen to be um, in color. It was actually a black and white. And I'm definitely a colour guy. I mean, I love black and white, but I'm, I'm firmly more in colour than, than black and white. Um, so I finished off those two, those two last shots, and I began to basically kind of go between colour, sorry, uh, between 35mm camera and my medium format. Um, so my medium format camera has 10 shots, my 35 has 36. So as soon as one would finish, or the medium format would finish, I would go onto the 35, give them a bit of a break, and then go back to the medium format once I'd reloaded. Um, now they are actually, they're actually a couple um, and I'd actually shot with Tamsin quite a few times um, and I'll show you a few more shots of her um, later on. Um, but um, when I had this idea, 
um, she told me she had a boyfriend and I thought well it'd be perfect to actually use this setup with them a real couple I, f I actually found that they actually it brought a certain sense of realism to the, to the scenario and the kind of um, and the kind of vibe that I wanted um, so I'll move on to the next shot um, so I've given you a medium format I've given you the black and white and this is actually one of the colors of the 35 mil so this is actually so this is arguably the less high quality version of those three shots that I've just shown you. Um, so what I did basically over the course of about an hour, I just sat them down and I treated them to an Orangina and a Fentiman's Cola as well uh, to keep them sweet. Um, and I, I did want something that wasn't, I was quite specific about what I wanted in that table. You know, I didn't want, you know, I didn't want a Fanta, you know, I didn't want a Dr. Pepper, I wanted something stranger than that you know I, I wanted you to doubt what it might be you know, so that was very specific about those things but I also didn't want them to be obvious as to what they were so I turned around the labels um, but I also like the shapes and I also like the color so I very specifically chose those um, those two bottles um, but I basically sat them there for upwards of an hour basically just telling them to kiss and that's kind of what I did um, and it was weird because <laughs> because I'd actually shot with Tamsin quite a lot of times before this. I think I've been shooting with Tamsin maybe, I don't know, I think my first shoot with her was in November of last year. This was February, so about three months. So we'd had a, we'd had a few outings, kind of usually at night, usually in weird places in Brighton. Um, and we actually get on really well, but as soon as her boyfriend came into the, into the dynamic, things became not weird, more like, I think for her it was weirder because she knew me and she knows her boyfriend but it's like it's almost as if she became i don't know i guess self-conscious that i didn't know her boyfriend and he didn't know me so she was kind of like maybe second guessing what the scenario would be so i think for the first kind of maybe 15 20 minutes um things were a little strange um i guess so i just kind of want them to be as natural as possible and i guess just do what they do normally which is probably kiss i think they just started seeing each other so i think kissing lots is not something that was too much of a stretch for them really um, and I think they enjoyed it as well um, I, I think Tamsin was certainly getting kind of um, a bit blushy towards the end <laughs> to say the least um, so that was quite a long time to, sub to subject them to that um, and uh, a lot of people have asked me whether this is a candid shot and, and I'm usually very honest with it I don't I don't normally hold back and say oh you know I'll leave that up to you I'm, I'm quite honest about it and I always say it's, it's a setup um, just because I, 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 don't, I just don't see the point in lying about that. You know, I also don't want to be mysterious about it. You know, it's, I prefer it if people don't ask me. Like, that's my preference, but if they ask me, I will, I will, I will, I will say the truth. Um, but I think what was important for me more than anything is for Tamsin's expression to be believable. I think that was the most important thing for me. Um, is I wanted her to connect with, with me or my lens and almost give off this idea that she was being interrupted in a very kind of like emotive moment for her um, and I think it kind of worked I mean th there has been times when I haven't looked at this image for a while um, and I've just kind of brought it up on my on my Lightroom or whatever and it's kind of like just kind of I don't know made me a bit I don't know I feel like embarrassed that I'm walking in on someone you know I think when you see it in like you know in a retina screen it kind of just jump up at you a little bit and then she's looking right at me so I think for me at least um, it definitely kind of um, impacted me and I think um, I don't know, I think the image just works. Anyway, so I've done this in the completely wrong order. I've shown you the three best images and I'm going to show you the worst ones. So I should have done it the other way around, really. Um, so, so that's um, arguably a better exposed version of the previous image. Uh, I like the colours in this. Um, but her expression wasn't right. She seemed almost disturbed in this one. And even though I do like it, it's not right. And I, I pretty, I mean, I think if this had been my only usable image, I would have been a bit upset with myself just because I, it just wasn't right for me. Um, the colors are good, you know, the, it's, I think it's reasonably in focus. <laughs> um, but um, her expression wasn't right. She, I don't know, um, it just didn't speak to me in the way the others do really. So, and that's, I think a slightly better exposed version of the other one. Um, but again, it didn't have quite the right vibe for me. 
I think that's the same image, or maybe slightly closer. And this is the one that really did it for me. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, I think there's something kind of a bit dark about it. I don't know. I think she actually genuinely looks a bit surprised. But it's, she's still clutching to him, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it as a desperate clutch. So if it was a desperate clutch, it would have been a bit weird, I think. But there's still kind of a very much kind of like girl interrupted, and I think that's pretty much what I wanted. You know, it's that moment interrupted there and then, and then it becomes quite personal with, with, well, I mean, with me, but I, I imagine also, also with the viewer um, as well. So, so that's that. Um, I'm not sure why I did it in this order. I kind of did a big jump there from like my first lot of images onto this. Um, I think it just felt right at the time. I'm kind of like, yeah, maybe that wasn't the right order of things to do, but it's all right. Um, so, so I, as I was saying, I think people in my image is something that I'm really trying to get into more. I just find I kind of relate to, to my images a lot more. I enjoy the process a lot more. And I think that's something that I found ever since that image in Lewis, um, I think for me, it became about the process. So when I, when I look at digital and film, and I really don't like to talk about it too much because I think people can get the wrong end of the stick. It's like the whole film digital debate, you know, which I'm not really interested in to be honest with you. I am, but not, not in like, you're wrong and I'm right. It's more like, it's interesting to talk about it, to, to get the different takes. But I think for me, in terms of film and digital, I think the final, the final product is, can be equally as rewarding to you. But for me personally, I found the journey with film much more enjoyable. So the whole concept of kind of like loading and unloading the film and knowing that when you're taking a shot, there's something actual physical inside your camera, like the, the image is there. It's not, it's not noughts and ones. I, I, I quite like that and I think it just appeals to my nature. And I think it's, I think it's a very personal thing. But, um, but aside from that, I think it's more the journey um, and the, the process of doing it. I kind of enjoy, getting the negatives back and scanning them and getting a couple of beers in and spending all night um, kind of doing, you know, playing with my images basically. Um, sometimes I go back to them and just rescan the whole roll which will take me another four hours but I kind of enjoy that process. I find it kind of very relaxing and, I don't know, yeah, just quite relaxing in a weird way. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I think it was around the time of the last of the digital images, um, the one I took in, in Chatham, which was Emily kind of like walking away with the blue and the yellow kind of side, that I kind of like, I guess, organically fully transitioned to film. And that was basically when I went to, um, to Peru and decided that I wanted to shoot everything on film. Um, so I'll see if I can find you an image that was actually from around that time. And I think this is one. So this was taken in Cusco, um, and this was shot on film as well. Um, and there were still elements of kind of what I was doing before with, with, with digital that I really wanted to kind of carry on doing, but I wanted to see how much I could do it with film and whether my skill set was actually there for me to be able to do it. So lighting was still very much um, important to me. So even though here you actually see that I'm not sure what this is. When I saw that, I was actually quite fearful if I shot anyone in this image, they would think that I'd actually done that digitally. I'm not sure what that is. I think it's just a street light, but it seems like it's almost like too bright to be a street light. So, um, so I wasn't really sure as to what that was. But So normally, when I would have taken an image that is digitally, I would have been very critical of myself, and the lighting is not quite right. But I think this, this, this is one of the first images that I took, and I was finally able to just let go of what I was doing and not think about the editing process too much. I was able to just go, this is the film, this is it. This is why I chose it, or this is why I won't choose it again. Um, this is one of those images that kind of really reminded me of that, um, that it's not perfect, but I think that's kind of, not the point, but that's kind of what I was able to just kind of let go of. Um, and the whole series of images I've taken through, they're very different, there's a lot of nighttime shots that I took. Um, and they're all very similar in that respect, that they're not perfect, but I was kind of able to just say I'm quite happy with this process. Um, and there was not, I don't think there was much doubt for me, I just kind of carried on doing it, but I think that was a real turning point for me. Um, whereas before I was taking maybe two or three days to begin editing my photos and then 
having a day of rest and then going back to it and seeing what I was doing afterwards um, that um, I kind of realized that that process for me was just taking far too long. Whereas with film it takes a lot longer to do things because you have to research what film stocks you want. Um, you know, you're, you're tied down to a lot of things when you're shooting. You can't just crank up your ISO. So if you're suddenly stuck with 100 ISO film in your camera and you've got 16 shots left and you've got no light left, that's kind of what you've got left. But I think that can teach you in itself something that you may not necessarily know. Um, so you might just shoot 100 ISO films severely underexposed in, in the night and actually find that you love the results. So it's, the whole thing is a kind of experimentation. And I, and I quite like that that I, I, you relinquish a certain amount of control to the film. So, quite oddly, it seems like I've basically like incorporated a lot of randomness in my workflow, which is not something I would ever expect would actually happen, you know, whereas everything was meticulously kind of done before, you know, sharpness, highlight retention, shadow, now it's kind of more like, okay, this is the film stock, this is how it behaves, and we'll just let it go, kind of thing. Um, so that was Peru. Um, and this is, I guess, another similar shot. Um, and this was taken in um, Dungeness in Kent. I don't know how many of you have been to Dungeness. Um, guessing not many of you. Um, it's a great place. Um, it's probably my favourite place on earth. <laughs> Maybe not on earth, but certainly one of my favourite places in England. Um, it has a very otherworldly vibe, um, it's, it just feels like nowhere else I've ever been. Um, and in going there, you kind of want to be able to capture what it feels like to be there. Um, and I found that over the last two years, I've been there maybe four or five times, I don't know, maybe three or four times. And I find that whenever I go, I get really excited by the shots that I'm getting when I scan them in, and then maybe a week or two weeks later, I'm already planning my next trip because I'm not happy. Because so I feel like for whatever reason, it hasn't fully captured kind of what it, fe what it feels like to be there. But I think this is the one shot that I have of Dungeness amidst hundreds um, that I think does capture the weirdness of this place. Um, and oddly enough, I actually sold one of these prints quite recently and um, I sold it via my Instagram. And the lady who bought it, she, um, she said, I really want this, and um, she gave me her sizing and everything. And then when it came to actually doing the final print, I actually brought it up on Lightroom um, and just saw all of this dust. And normally with, with film, you do get a lot of dust in your images. And when you scan them in, depending on what kind of scanner you have, you can actually remove the dust via infrared. It's like an infrared thing built into the scanner. It's actually very easy to remove, and it doesn't actually remove any of the sharpness or the tonality of the image. It just as a scan, it will remove, I don't know, 90% of that. So I had two images, and they were basically like identical except for none of the dust. And when I messaged them, I said, in all fairness, when you saw the image on my Instagram, it was like this big. And she could see me with a couple of speckles that said, you know, this image is severely dusty. You know, do you want the one with dust and the one without dust? And she said, please give me the dusty one, the dustier the better. And um, she loves it. And I mean, it's something that I've thought about a lot um, in terms of the imperfections within this image. Um, but it just feels right to me. Um, I don't know why, it just feels right to me. I didn't second guess it when I saw it. I just went, this feels right to me. To leave in, and my personal preference is this image as well. It has a certain dimension to it. The dust kind of gives it like, a sense that it's not reality, it's something else. And I think with a lot of my images, I don't, I don't want to recreate reality. I don't want my colors to be perfect. I don't want perfect white balance everywhere. I don't want the blues to be blue and the yellows to be yellows. And I want it to look a certain way. And sometimes, often, I don't know what that's going to be. It's, it just happens and you're like, okay. Um, and this film is really unusual as well. It's, um, it's, cinematic print film. So this is the film that you would use to make. Um, so if you're shooting a film in Hollywood with 35mm cameras, you, you use this film to make duplicates of that film. So it's extremely low ISO. 
So it's very, very high resolution as well. So with this one, I really didn't know what was going to happen. It had a severe blue cast all over it, which I had to get rid of in, in the scan. So again, even when I took this, I really didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and that's true of that entire roll that I took as well. Um, it was kind of like a happy surprise. And obviously, you never know how much dust you're going to get. You don't know if you're going to get a huge light leak either. You know? um, so it's, it's almost like potluck. But I think that, that's part of the process as well, is kind of almost being, it's like letting yourself go to it and you just kind of go, what will happen will happen. Obviously there are certain times when if you're doing something commercial, you know, that you might not want that. So you want to get Kodak Porsche 400 and make sure that it's, it's always going to be like perfect. Um, but if it's a personal project, I think you can have a bit more experimentation. You know? So I wouldn't necessarily recommend shooting these weird films for like a commercial project or something that you have to get it right. But I think for certain things, you know, which you don't mind a bit of experimentation, I think it can potentially work quite well as well. Um, so yeah. Well, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't, you, don't you think it looks like it? It almost looks as if it's a, a, a slide. Or, um, yeah. A light box. Yeah. Because I think nowadays they are so much used to if you see any dust because you should kind of don't use a negative process anymore, so you see the dust as Dark specs, yeah. you know, on the sensor. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Whereas because it's a negative process, actually does appear as white pieces, yeah. Yes. And it almost kind of, almost seems to talk about energy underneath, or the energy beyond, I think. It almost, first I thought like, that almost looks like yeah, something that was the... I remember we once had a, some sort of issue coming in, um, who, takes photographs that he used to pierce basically holes into the print and then right. photograph them against the against the window with a magnificent um, magnificent effect here. Yeah. So you can really see like the energy behind something, this dimension behind it. And that somehow I see what you mean, it, yeah. That's this kind of depth that it gains, I think. Yeah, I mean it's I mean I can't really I mean I'm not an expert in, in film by any chance, you know. Um, but I think for me, it's, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how to explain it. I think, I think for me, this image, um, it kind of, I remember when Instagram first came out in 2011, I think it was, um, and I remember seeing all of these filters, and this was way before I was photographing anything seriously. And I just seeing all these effects and going, wow, this looks awesome, like X-Pro2 and all of these kind of like mental vignettes I used to get. And I used to just love it, you know, and I think everyone used to just, I think everyone just went mental with it, like you photograph your, I don't know, anything, on, you know, anything was around you, you'd photograph and you'd add that vignette because it made everything look great, you know. And I think for me, like, I remember when I began photographing and certainly film, I was almost trying to discover what these film stocks were because I wanted to kind of like somehow find that, you know. Um, not necessarily to settle on a particular one, it was more like these are all based on something and there's a reason why we like them, there's a certain emotional response to this imperfection. And I think, and I think emotional response is a big part of photography. Um, you know, I think, I think you can have great saturation and great sharpness and you know, you know, good focus and stuff, but I think there's a lot to be said also for, for emotional response. There's a certain je ne sais quoi to an image that has nothing to do with sharpness or this or that, really. you just like it because you like it. You know, if you see like a Henry Carter Bresson photograph, it's all shot in 35 mil, probably out of focus, um, probably lots of blur everywhere, you know, extremely grainy, but you look at it and you go, wow, that's incredible, you know? And it's not technically perfect, it's just a great image, you know? And I think, I think something like this, I'm not comparing this to Bresson, by the way, but I think it's, it's that imperfection that I kind of like relate to. I, I just quite like it. And like you were saying, you know, I think, I think it's, there's a certain three-dimensionality to it. It's very much like those dusts are sitting on top of the image rather than being a part of it, which is what you get with, um, with a sensor with dust. You know, you'll have like a black speck that just looks like it's really, you know, this looks like it's just on top or something. Um, I, don't know. I, I struggle to explain it, but um, I think just very much kind of having someone buy a print and saying, I want it to be imperfect, said a lot to me about kind of the emotional response to an image. So if you wanted to ask me a question, I would just talk to you, sorry, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> take, take. So um, that's my, I mean, uh, when you talked about the couple earlier, there's always, you kind of explain it to me the other way around. If you start with your digital images, we're really trying to get the 
best slide and the best exposure and everything, and we really uh, put it uh, like uh, retouching the light away and stuff like that. And then you show me this, where I'm like, why would you? And not, I'm not saying that, <laughs> uh, but this is the total opposite. Yes. That you let things happen and just let go of it. Yes. And uh, I know you've been explaining that, but it's so interesting. I understood, I'm not sure if that's my English or not, but I understood that you only saw all the dust when you saw it. No, no, no. no it was, it you was, were aware of that. I, I was aware of the dust, okay. but when when I when I when the when the request came to buy the print, ah, okay. I then I said know. to her, "You have to opt because on on Instagram you can't really see these dust yeah, that well. You can maybe see that one and that yeah. one." Yeah. So when I brought it up, I was like, "Oh my god, if I print yeah. this and she sees all this dust, she's gonna freak out." So and she was like, yeah. "Give it to me, like I want it like this, yeah. you know." Um, and you actually find a lot of that, you know, a lot of the images um, that I do keep, I'll do two versions. Uh, and generally speaking, my process is I'll scan and I will do what I call a raw image, which is no, nothing on it, which is this. Save for a bit of white balance, maybe sometimes. <laughs> but yeah. if it's really blue, for example, I, I will retouch a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, I don't really touch the image. And I'll do this one and I'll do another one, which will have no dust on it. I tend to want to always finish my images ready for print. I don't like to scan for Instagram or scan for uh, Flickr or whatever. I, I, I spend, each scan takes me three minutes to do uh, each frame um, at the highest possible resolution as a TIFF and that's the image that I always save because um, I want it ready all the time, um, ready to go and print for example. Um, so, yeah, so that's the story behind that one. Um, so, this is. Um, so, you, you know, I promised you to ask. You know, have, I, have I been an hour and a half already? No, no, no. Which scanner do you use? Oh, what scanner do I use? What scanner makes this a scanner? I use a Minolta Dimage. Multipro. Um, it's very good. It's 15 years old. 15 years old, um, and they don't. You can't repair it. Um, if anything goes wrong with it, it's done forever. And it still costs me about a thousand pounds, just because because film obviously is playing second fiddle to digital. They don't make it that good anymore. So if you want it, you have to just put up with the fact that it might break, um, and there's no other way around it. Unless you go 25,000 pounds for a drum scanner or whatever. So there's not much in between. I think maybe now um, they're releasing a lot, a lot of new film stocks as a revival in film. Um, it might be something. I very much doubt it. You know, I'm, I'm very scared about that. To be honest with you. But um, so yeah. So as promised, we've got Tamsin for you again, uh, and this is one of <laughs> hundreds of shots I've got for her. And there is a bit of a background um, to this, and I think maybe I should have started with this image here. And. And this kind of maybe shows a little bit as to where I get my inspiration from. Um, if I can find it, that is. Organization is not my strong point. Um, so, this is Tamsin again. And I think around this time I kind of became very, um, I wouldn't say obsessed, that's a bad word, but I think. I almost became very taken um, by a film that was very much visuals led, and that's Par I don't know if you've seen Paris, Texas. It's a Wim Wenders film, um, and Wim Wenders is actually a photographer. I don't think he was a photographer first, but I think he's a very, very keen photographer. So even though he's had Hollywood films and stuff and kind of outlook, he still very much goes out on road trips on his own and still shoots film because he likes it, you know. And it was the first film that I watched that it was so it had such strong visuals, you know, and and. Um, had a female lead who actually looks, should I say Tamsin, looks a lot like a female lead. Um, and I kind of wanted to recreate something without giving the impression that I was doing a direct copy of it. You know, I, I have a weird relationship with copying people's work because I have, I wouldn't say I've done it, but I, I've definitely kind of crossed that line where I felt like I was copying someone's work. And um, I think for me, it's, I think if you're the one being copied, you can definitely take that badly, you feel like someone's trying to rip you off, but I think as the copier, it's more like, I love your work so much, I want to try to do it, if anything, just to learn what your process is. Um, 
So I think around that time there was a chap called Toby Harvard, which I, I was semi obsessed with his work just because I loved it so much. And um, his work was extremely grainy. It was all shot in 35 mm film. And, I mean, sadly here you see this as kind of noise, but it's, this is actually very, very grainy and it actually looks like film grain. And I kind of wanted, I wanted to bring that out and I had to do a lot of research behind that to try and find the right expired film. And expired film is, it's very tricky to deal with. You never really know what you're going to get. So you have to do a lot of research and you're trying to find as to what films are going to that look. You know, what whites are going to go to green. So, for example, even though this image has had a little bit of white balance uh, done to it, this light here is actually like a, a fluorescent strip light. And whenever you point daylight balance film to strip lights, it goes green. And I'm sure many of you will have noticed that. So I didn't want it to go too green, but there is aspects of green everywhere in the image. Um, and I really like that. So I tried to find a film that would really accentuate those greens. Um, and I found it in this old film called Film Ferrania. Uh, it hasn't been made for seven years, so anything that you find will be at least seven years old, sometimes a lot older. Um, and again, with this one, I played, a lot, I, played, I played a lot around with exposure. So I think Tamsin was actually two stops underexposed. Um, in the shot, you know, and I think I just decided to roll with it and just go, what will happen if I underexpose this image? Um, and film has a weird way of exposing. Film doesn't work in the same way as digital in terms of exposure. I mean, technically it does, but it, does, it has a very different effect on exposure. Colours can change, so if you underexpose by a stop or two stops, things that were white will go to pink, for example, and then it will underexpose after three or four stops. So. So I found that this role of film was very much, you know, very much an experimentation for me. Um, but I actually ended up really, really liking the results. And, and more importantly, I wanted to place Tamsin somewhere where it was like a, I can't really describe it, it was more like a place that's, that's neither here nor there. It was like a moment, and that's all it was. But uh, again, very much influenced by cinema, just a different type of cinema. Whereas before I felt like I was being influenced by kind of like digital cinema. Now my influence became kind of more like, more imperfect, maybe something to do with like an 80s film shot on film kind of thing. So similar aesthetics, but with a few more imperfections, and this is kind of the result. Because after this, I decided to actually stick around with this film, and it's actually a film that I shot, and I still shoot with now, um, even though it's increasingly more and more difficult to find it, just because there's no more stock left, so you have to just try and find it somehow. Um, so, um, so yeah, so this, this is actually the beginning of, um, of a, uh, of Tamsin as being used as my muse. Um, and this is kind of another example um, of um, this film. Um, it's called Film for Anya. Um, and this one's not as imperfect, but you can see that there's actually obviously color shifts everywhere. You know, there's a certain greenness about it, but you can't tell where it is. And, and again, I did not intend for this image to look necessarily like this, it just kind of happened. Um, so like, normally when you have, normally when you have like white balance issues, you can see like green or red in the blue, or blue in the white, or too much green in the reds. That, that's kind of how I think of um, colour shifts happening. Whereas this image, there's something wrong with it. I don't know what it is. I, I, I can't tell where it is, but it's, to me it seems like it's not reality. It seems like it's something else. Because um, the blues look blue, the orange looks orange, the white looks a little bit green, uh, I'll give you that, but the shadows kind of generally look okay. Kind of but um, yeah, I can't tell where, where the issues are, whereas normally an image with incorrect white balance on digital, you can see very much where the blues are, the, or, the, or, the, or the yellows and reds. With this, I kind of can't. Um, again, with this one, as you can see, I very much decided to leave all of the dust specks on it. I think I did remove one down here, which was a bit too prominent. Um, but again, generally I wanted to leave it kind of like that. Um, and, um, and yeah, uh, but like I said, I don't always leave them in. I think it depends on what the image is. Um, I will sometimes leave it and sometimes won't. And sometimes I have a huge imperfection, which I wish, wish wasn't there, but I can't actually remove, so I'm stuck with it. <laughs> Um, as generally speaking, I will never put my images in Photoshop. The most I'll ever do is go into Lightroom and make small touches to, to the image. Um, but I'll go back to an image that I showed you a second ago before I got rid of it and showed you something else. But it's, it's this one here. 
So again, that's, um, that's Tamsin again. And as you can see, this image is even grainier. Um, so this was shot with the same film. Um, I think it was actually the same day as the one I showed you in the car park. Um, and again, this was severely, severely underexposed. And again, I wasn't trying to copy any particular frame in Paris, Texas. Um, it was more like I just wanted a vibe. I think for me that film is punctuated by lots of shots that really stick on, on the actress's face like a lot, or she's doing nothing. She's literally just standing there, just kind of going. And then it cuts to something else. And I kind of wanted that. Um, of course, with this image, it's difficult to give it context. Um, for cinema, we have all the story that's put on before it to work out what's happening. With this, you don't have that. I'm literally just giving you this in the hope that you're going to like it. You know. Um, so again, it's very much experimenting with with people's faces and looks and I guess what I want as well out of an image and what I want her to do and the only way to do it, the only way to figure that out is to just do it, fail, do it again, fail and do it again until you kind of just know kind of like what it is. So when I first started on with, with Tamsin I was shooting maybe three roles and just going Ch yeah that's kind of okay, Ch oh, that's okay, Ch that's okay but it's now I'm like no that's not okay, do this, no it's still not okay and so I think the more you do it and the more you experiment, um, the more you get more selective as to what you're going to shoot it. Um, and I still get it hideously wrong sometimes, but <laughs> um, it's kind of about kind of just slowing down and just make sure you get your shots. Because in the end, you know you're going to be stood in front of, or sorry, sat in front of your scanner and your screen and seeing the images and going, I'm not going to use this. So it's just kind of understanding as to what that frame is going to look like. And because my, my kit is very simple, um, I mean, I don't shoot with a zoom. Um, that's another thing that I could potentially talk about. Um, I mean, I did, I did tell the whole girl I wasn't going to talk about too much about tech. Um, but um, I think not using a zoom has really helped me a lot in working out my images. So I, don't, I only shoot with two lenses. I shoot with a 28mm lens and I shoot with a 50mm lens. And that's on my 35 and on my medium form. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, 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 carry on, carry on. No, 35 so if, yeah, for 35mm, I'll use a 28mm lens and a 50 Just those two lenses. Um, so a wide and a, I guess a normal lens, what you'd call it, a normal lens. It's like longer than normal lens. Um, and for medium format, I use a 50mm lens, sorry, a 40mm lens, or the equivalent of a 40mm lens. And I just find that having that really allows me to understand kind of my frames. I can always, well, maybe not yet, but I can almost pre-visualize what my frame's going to look like. Whereas with a zoom, you find that when you're, when you're using your viewfinder, you just do that. So you, you never have an assault, you don't, let's say it, you never really know where you're at. Unless you're really keeping your eye on, on where you're zooming, you could be at 16, you could be at 17, you could be at 18, 19, 20. I know very few photographers that know what they're at because they don't need to know because all they have to do is change so it's in many ways they don't need to know they just do it because it's so quick and even though there's no problems with that I actually find that I really like knowing my lenses now if I see something I know if I need to change or how much I need to step back because I have that intimacy with the focal length so it's almost like I know what that frame is going to look like to me and I, I kind of I really like that you feel like almost like more at one and you actually work quite quickly even though you're having to swap primes you actually work quite quickly. Um, so yeah, so this is another another shot of Tamsin. Um, again, it's part of the same series. And I think for this one, I really wanted to have good light on her, um, but also have a little bit a little bit of detail in the background. I think this is this is one of the shots that I actually looked at. And I think I don't necessarily wish that I'd taken this on digital, but I think this is something that would have looked great on digital because I think some of the detail here is actually lost a little bit. Um, whereas if it was digital, I think that would have popped a lot more and not have all the break of the brain in the background, like taking away from the colour. Um, so there are, there's a few images like this one that I look at and I think actually this could have been maybe a little bit better with digital and I could have added grain to it. But then that's kind of going back to the old person doing too much post work. So it's kind of like give and take. I think overall I, I was quite happy with that. And that was shot under heavy tungsten 
heavy tungsten light and purposefully with daylight balanced film because I wanted it to literally go orange. I wanted, I wanted it to be almost otherworldly. Um, and I guess it's because I personally, I don't really like taking normal portraits. I think everyone does that. Um, don't get me wrong, I do see a lot of portraits and I do like them, but I think there's like a difference between appreciating other people's work against what you want to shoot and create. And I think that's, for me, the difference. So whenever I don't want to do something, it doesn't mean that I like it. It's more like it's just not quite what you're interested in. Because there's other people probably making much, much better work than I'm doing in terms of portraiture. Um, so I did want something a little bit kind of weirder and a bit kind of off the wall. Um, even though technically sometimes it's not necessarily great for a, for a female model. Um, Good question. Do you use a there? No. So, um, that is, um, I mean, that's one of the orangest lights that I can find where I live. And I, live in, I live in Brighton, and that's one of the orangest lights. That I, I, think it's, I think it's maybe even a safety light, um, quite possibly, around an industrial estate. I mean, it's extremely orange. I mean, I don't even know what the white balance is on it, but when I saw, when I saw it, I, I knew I had to shoot it with daylight film because then that would go orange to me, you know, and that's exactly kind of what it did. Um, and I did shoot kind of a few like that. Um, but I was also being very careful in making sure that I don't, because I'm, I'm quite traditional in, in my view of females being photographed. I think if I'm shooting a female, I want to be respectful of them as well. Um, I don't want to make them look ugly. I don't want to make them feel like they shouldn't have done this photo shoot with me. So even though they know that it's going to be a bit strange, at the same time, I don't want to make them look unattractive. If anything, I want to make them look maybe otherworldly, but certainly not unattractive. And I think that's just me being quite traditionalist in my view of, of portraiture with women, I think. Um, so, um, and then obviously like, this is another image uh, of Tamsin, which didn't make the cut for me. I've never actually shown this to anyone um, other than Tamsin, maybe my girlfriend. Um, I just found it a little bit, I liked her expression, but it just didn't quite make the cut. And obviously here, there's a lot of imperfection at the top, and I just didn't find that that was really kind of good um, to be around her face. I could have removed it, but I just think overall the image for me just didn't work as well as the others, um, so I chose to leave this one out. Um, plus, which I'd shot so many of these that you know it was it was difficult to to justify making a series out of these, considering they were very very similar images. So I had to be not brutal, but I think I had to select the best ones. And this is one that did make the cut for me, um, and. I don't know, I just, again, I just like this. Um, it's almost like it's a moment like in film where you pull focus from a background and you pull focus back to reveal the face, except that this, in this shot, we haven't actually pulled the focus. We've just remained uh, focused on the, on the background. But again, um, there are certain times when I do see, when I watch films and there's moments that I see, there's colors that I see that I really enjoy and it's just trying to replicate the colours and it's, it's working with a colour palette. I think that's something that I'm thinking a lot about now with my photography. It's, aside from the things that have always interested me, which are light and composition, I think colour for me is one of the most important things. Um, and it's something that I'm, I'm looking at all the time. Um, I think black and white is great for certain things, uh, when there's a dull day, uh, when there's too much green and yellow or whatever, but Generally speaking, if I'm seeking out to do a photo shoot that's, you know, a reasonable setup uh, with models, I will always look out, look out for interesting colour to be around the frame. Um, but like I said, yeah, this is a, this is just a moment. Um, the way I envisioned it in a film before you would pull focus, but I almost like the fact that you can't quite see her facial expression, um, but not enough to make her look unattractive. I think. I think. There's a certain something here where you can see where her eyes and her, and her mouth would be, and a bit like her nose as well, especially the further back you are. Um, okay, so, and this is another one um, from around the same time. And um, again, um, this is uh, Alicia, and it's someone that I've shot with a few times. Um, and Alicia was, was someone that I actually worked with uh, for, for a little over a year. And it's someone that I never really spoke to at work. It's someone that I just saw um, from time to time, 
usually having a cigarette or talking to someone. And I, I think just sometimes I would just catch her doing something and it was very subtle. Um, and she had a certain sadness to her face, which I think I, I really liked. And I think I just really wanted to try and capture that, you know, in some way. It's almost like she was almost deep in thoughts. Um, and I think that's kind of what I wanted to capture. Um, but again, I think for me, because of the way that I like to set up my shots, it's, it's never just about the person. I think for me it's important to place them within some kind of context. Um, I like to place them in an environment. Um, and even though I don't mind explaining my images necessarily, I think what I like is I like to, I like to make an image that when you arrive at it, it does something for you just visually. Obviously, these images are not for everyone. You know, I don't expect them to be. But I think for the right person or for the person that would, would, would appreciate it, I want them to arrive at it and like it and then have an explanation afterwards. I don't necessarily want to have all images that I, I might enjoy explained to me. I don't want to feel emotion necessarily after I've had an explanation. I like to have emotion straight away and then maybe have the explanation of the image or the series to elevate it further. If that makes any sense, I'm sure if that makes some kind of sense. Um, so again, so I think I think it's trying to find a way to find that magic combination of colours that com almost aids that feeling that I might want her to to give off, which is slightly melancholy. Um, and I'm not sure if I succeeded, but when I saw the shot, I, I knew this was this was the, this was the right this was the right frame um, to choose out of that series as well. So, and I'm going to give you something completely different now. Um, I don't know about completely, but certainly a little bit different. And it's this. Um, and this image is, um, is an image that I very much like. Um, and there's a very specific reason I brought this image up. Um, and it's kind of like... I think this image in many ways represents like like a battle I have in my head as to where where I want my work to go. Um, this image I just I just I think I was in I think I was in Miami Beach of all places. We were on a stopover from coming back from Peru back to the UK and we just had a delicious Denny's breakfast and we went for a walk just to walk it off and I just kind of saw this and I just immediately just loved the colour and I loved the strange shapes and I loved the way the image was broken up um, and it's an image that I still very much like and, and oddly enough it's one that I always go back to um, but the reason it represents something kind of unusual for me is that this image is very different to the rest of my work um, yet it's something that I'm still very much interested in doing um, so when it comes to the future of my work, I kind of always, always struggle as to where it's going to go. Um, and I think when you go to university or you are at college, um, or even when you're reading about photography, there's a lot of people that do tell you that your work should be going towards somewhere, almost have like a stamp, you know, like that makes it you, you know. Um, and and I kind of like the idea of that, but I kind of almost don't want to just stop doing photography that I like because of that idea. I still want to carry on taking shots of things that I want, um, even if it's kind of going completely away from, from, from the things that I really, really want to focus on. So it's, it's almost like this image represents like a battle between like having a cohesive work against stuff like this. So, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Martin Parr's work, um, but you know if Martin Parr kind of began doing, I don't know, dog photography, you know, you'd find it weird, wouldn't you? Because you don't expect Martin Parr to start doing dog photography. Um, or if Gregory Crutzen began doing kind of, I don't know, like HDR landscapes, you know, or something. It's, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's like you, you have a signature and you kind of do it and it's almost like, when you become a photographer, when you realize you want to be one, you're almost edging towards wanting to have this, this kind of like style that basically binds all of your work, you know, and I think, and I'm not really sure about that. I think in order to, 
to find your voice, you have to just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot as much as you can. And sometimes even share your work just to see as to kind of what the response is. I think a lot of photographers also kind of forget that um, I think photography is for you and I think you should never sell out your photography, but I think at the same time, photography is like a form of language to many people, it's a form of expression and you're expressing yourself because I think you want to communicate with others or reach out to other people. So I think, I think you shouldn't stop doing that, you know, just because someone thinks that you should have a binding body of work kind of thing. Um, but again, it's still something I very much kind of fight with all the time when I see something like jagged and stuff and I think oh I shouldn't take a photo of that because it's not kind of like quite what I like. Um, Can I ask you a little question? Yeah, yeah sure. So why is the reason that you think that this is very different from the rest of your photography? Because uh, you, you want to focus more on portraiture rather than it's um I mean it's a it's a it's I, I think so I'll bring the image back up again because otherwise I get a bit lost. <laughs> um, not not necessarily the portraiture, it's it's kind of the style. Um, I think, I think whenever I look at I, when I look at my own work, I look at other people's work and I kind of compare it. And you know, I see a lot of people's work and I think this is a binding element here. It's either color, um, it's either shape, um, or it's something else that I can't remember right now. But I just find that this image, <coughs> images of this type, are very, very, very different to um, to the images that I also like to do. So I'll post an image like this today. I say post because even though I, I do want to print a lot more work into exhibitions, you know, I think I find Instagram to be my biggest, it's, like a, it's, like, it's almost like a daily way to kind of like put stuff out there, you know? So when I say post, I do mean Instagram, guys. Um, so it, for me, it seems jarring to post an image like this and then post an image with Tamsin and her boyfriend because they're staggeringly different images like staggeringly different whereas if you see for example work like by Martin Parr even though they're different people in different places there is a binding idea you know he uses a triangle you know where there's a triangle of things within the image that you focus on you know like Joseph Kudelka I don't know if you guys know Joseph Kudelka uh, but Joseph Kudelka is very famous for using a triangle you know where he would make you focus on any one of those points in that triangle but you always go back you can start on any and you go like this so it's always that point of interest within the image you know so with Martin Parr you always have that you have like you know a dog kind of like sniffing at a dog you know and like a woman kissing someone else and then this little boy looking at her boobs or something you know so there's always that three-way thing you know um, so there's always that kind of play with with Martin Parr and I'm not saying that you know I want that in this image you know but it's kind of like it's kind of like that you know I I think maybe I'm being critical of it but I just find that it's not just the color it's the composition the lack of people in it um, it's uh, God, I don't know what else it's for me it just looks very much like a different image um, Yeah. You okay? Yeah, right. I see. But that's in, no, that, that that's that's in, that's interesting that you say that. Into it, yeah. I see what you mean. I mean, I think maybe that is this is less, less of a personal image, but I think that, that in itself can be something that creates a look because the feel of an image is very personal to, to different people. You know, it's what is a feel? Is it color? Is it grain? Is it sharpness? Is it the scale? It could be any number of things. To me, those images look too different. Um, so it's something that I do kind of, um, I, I do struggle with a lot. Um, and. And this is one of the first kind of, I think it's one of the first photographs I took, <laughs> maybe, that I was kind of actually cared about. And um, yeah, this was, this was actually about three years ago. Um, and ironically, it's an image that I still very much, I personally like very, very much. It's digital, um, as you can see from all the stuff around it, there's a lot of grain which I added. Um, and I think my, my love for the film look kind of started around this time, which was about 2013, I guess, um, where I just wanted that. You know, I wasn't sure why I wanted it. I just knew that I wanted it, and I 
I didn't go for it for a while, but this is around the time that it that it kind of started. But ironically, this is kind of what I'm going back to now. It's a very much a nothing image that just encapsulates a moment. It's, it's an emotion. It's it's a certain freedom, I guess. It's something that you can't necessarily go. This is this is this. It's just something. You kind of just. I mean, I personally just look at it and I enjoy it. And that is something that I, I very much kind of want to get more into. And I think that's what's really important in my photography is that I don't necessarily want anyone to ask me the questions. I want someone to arrive at an image and they don't enjoy it. That's totally fine. I, don't, I really don't mind that. But it's more like just have an emotional response towards it. I think that for me is the most important thing. And it's a bit like, I don't know if you guys are watching any David Lynch films. Uh, David Lynch is not necessarily for everybody. Um, but David Lynch, very famous, he doesn't like to answer any questions about his films, you know. So like, what is this, what's the, what's the meaning of the twins in the little box? You know, he's like, don't worry about it, you know. If you have to ask me, then he's kind of lost on you. And, I mean, he can, he can come across as a little bit patronising sometimes, but um, I think, I, I think you have to just not question why you're enjoying something. I think you have to just accept what it is. A David Lynch film might not have a beginning, middle and end, but so long as you enjoy it, don't, don't think this is not a film. Just think of it as like, I enjoyed what I just watched, and that's it. Because <laughs> usually the answers will disappoint you. So it's actually not, it's better not to have the answers or, you know, or even make the questions. It's like, just look at it and just enjoy it. And usually it's just a feeling and an emotion. And I think for me, those feelings and emotions are captured because of colour, um, composition and light. I think those three things I think are very important to me. And I think even when you want to create a larger story, I think if you can incorporate those three things into anything you do, you'll be doing a lot better. Um, I, do know a lot, I do know a lot of photographers that are great photographers, but for them the story is much bigger than the photograph. The photograph just gives them an image for the story. Whereas for me, I think if you can, I'm not saying you have to, but if you can imbue with colour, light, and good composition, it will elevate it even further. I think that's kind of what I want, what I want to do. Obviously, I'm not too hot on big storylines. I think for me, it's more about what you arrive at. But I think those three things for me are, are very much kind of very important. So for me here, for example, I think I love the color of the sunglasses uh, just there. I like the reflection of that color in there as well. The blue here and the blue there. And it's just a bit of color pretty much kind of everywhere. And I think we do have a strange response to colour that we don't even fully understand. Um, for example, whenever I, on my Instagram, whenever I post a shot that has yellow, red, green and blue, it just does really well because people have that innate response to those colours, you know, especially when they're within the same frame. They might not know it, but they just respond to it. You know? So I think that's kind of quite important um, as well. Um, okay, so it's quite weird that I've gone like, I've done everything in the, completely in the wrong order, so I do apologise if I've confused you a little bit. Um, and I guess um, I could probably kind of go into like some future. That's no, I need I needed that. <laughs> I'll, 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 go, I'll go on for hours otherwise. But um, I'll go into kind of what I'm looking to do kind of in the future now. Um, so this is a shot. Uh, that I took about a year ago, and I honestly have no idea what I love, why I love this shot so much. I just simply, I, I, I love this shot, and I think I, I don't know if it's personal experience or or whatever, but I think I, I find it really fascinating, kind of what people are doing, kind of when I'm not around and stuff, you know, like where people live and what they're doing behind closed doors, and even if you don't know what it is, you know, it's like. A house almost kind of tell it tells you all that, but also tells you nothing, you know. And I and I really like that. So I think I think for me, I think over the next kind of like hopefully throughout this summer, I'm going to add on to this is it's like a series that I call settlements, you know. So it's kind of the idea is to kind of like capture people's homes, you know. And it's and it's not something that has been done. Sorry, that hasn't been done already. I think Todd Heido is someone who did this. Um, and he captured it at night with a single light source in the window. Um, but I think for me, I want, I want this to be a very British thing as well. Um, I find Britain very fascinating in terms of its architecture as to how horrible it can be, as you can probably see from this. And I think this, this ranks too high on everyone's dream home, but, um, 
but um, it's horrible for me in a very beautiful way as well in that it's very British you know there's a certain look to it that I just love you know um, so it's I think for me it's about kind of like capturing that um, a certain kind of like British kind of sentiment um, so it's not a series that'll be kind of too difficult for me to do I think it's um, very much kind of you know I, w I would say relatively easy for me to do um, I do have to travel around a bit for it probably, but um, generally speaking I do like to kind of walk a lot and, and not miss anything. So rather than driving, I don't drive, my girlfriend does drive, um, which, which is not too keen on doing all the time. So luckily I don't mind getting off on a train and just kind of walking around somewhere. And I do walk for miles uh, to try and find these things, so that's kind of going to be um, the next series. Um, and then kind of finally, and it's probably the, the biggest series for me just because of the investment that I'm going to have to make in time and effort and maybe sometimes money, it's going to be an extended version of my, of my couple series, which you've already seen um, a little bit of as well, which is basically based on, on this image. Um, and basically what I want to do is I just want to expand on this and um, I'm not sure exactly as to kind of what route it's going to take. I think it's going to change a little bit. At the moment I've maybe shot four different locations. Um, um, four different locations? Yeah, four different locations with one couple so far. So it'll, it'll serve as a test bed for what I might do in the future. So I'll work out which couples look best in which locations and then based on that I might revisit these locations to actually do the shoot. Um, and it's purely based on nostalgia um, for me. I think um, my work is very much nostalgic. I very rarely have any allowances for modernity in any of my images. Uh, not a mobile phone. I think I don't think you'll see anything beyond 1985 in any of my images, really. So um, I do I do really like a lot of that. So um, so I'll, I'll work out as to kind of what images suits each couple better. Uh, but it's very much an ongoing series. Um, and it will hopefully chronicle kind of stages of a relationship, uh, a romantic relationship. So from kind of lust to kind of anger, um, to jealousy, um, to, um, to love, for example. It could be anything. I'm not sure as to which way it's going to go. I think it might be very specific to each couple, depending on what, they, what, the vibe they, what, what vibe they give off. But I will try to use um, real couples as much as possible, just because I, I get a lot of... A lot more, a lot more of a genuine response. Plus, which if you ask them to be angry at each other, I think they can probably all recall a moment where they have been angry at each other. You know, so, um, so, um, so yeah. So I, I'm very much kind of like hot on that real kind of emotional response that we get from a couple, and I think it's much easier to get from a real couple, especially when I can't really afford to hire big actors, you know, to actually act that out for me. So. Generally speaking, you'll get a good response from from, uh, from real couples. So that's it's going to be an expansion on this um, with a very similar look, I guess. Um, shot on the same film that I shot this on, that's Kodak Portra 4, uh, 800, um, and on the same camera um, as well. So it will have, hopefully, at least a look that is as close to this as possible. So it'll become part of a wider series. And it might be compressed or widened depending on how well I think it goes. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's next in the pipeline. All right. <laughs>
uh, going to this photography where you actually have in this landscape shot where you have all the ducks in it and you decide to just leave it there. <laughs> so you, you're aiming for, for all the imperfections. Imperfections yeah. in a photography. And then you show that image, which I really, I think is brilliant. And um, it's so interesting how you talk about it because you started with talking about the light, and light is coming from da 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 da. And then you said, actually, I'm this girl, I, I use, I've taken a lot of pictures of So of for her. me, it was like this, this connection between you and the girl. And even better that you mentioned that it was weird when this boyfriend <laughs> <laughs> Because no, because actually this image is so, so well thoughtful yeah. around her. Yeah. And around her um, intention, what look she gives you. Even though her boyfriend is there, because she opens up to you every time. Yes. She with her. Um, and I really found it so interesting when you showed the one that didn't work for you, because it was basically it was um, really Same. that he was having his hand up. Yeah. And, like he was acting in a totally different way. Yeah. Yeah. And in this image, her shoulder is then like, more spotted. More well spotted. Yeah. And that's so interesting. When I come at me as someone who looks at it, would ask myself, did you tell her that? And, what to wear and did you tell her how to look and what to do and how long this so all the information she said but well, I mean, I answer the first part of your question because you had a lot, you had, you had a lot going on there, which is good because um, it's uh, it's really interesting to talk about the film kind of uh, and digital side of things. Um, um, I, I've tried my absolute best to to explain this. Um, I mean. I mean, Emma would probably hate me for this because I've always said this a million times, but I think for me, shooting film is, it's like, if you were to take like a, a plane journey somewhere, let's say you were to take a plane journey to Edinburgh, yeah, taking a plane journey to Edinburgh, like you hop on a, you hop on a plane and you arrive there, that's digital for me. Mm -hmm. Film is more like getting into like a van with all your friends with lots of beers and going to the same place. So you arrive at the same place, but the journey is completely different. And I like that. I mean... Photography for me is not this, it's not just this. I mean, this is, this is important, but I also have to enjoy that journey. So if both digital and film, I, I enjoy both end products, but with film, I also enjoy the journey, mm -hmm. then I'm gonna choose film. And that's it for me. So because, that, yeah. and, and there's, there's just a certain level of like, you naturally just let yourself go to film. You, you just, you, you give yourself up to it. You kind of go, this is it. And it makes me less lazy as well. It makes me, it makes me carry a light meter. It makes me have to understand light. I mean, I know a lot of photographers that still don't understand light. Pros. You know, I, know, I know a lot of pro kind of photographers that shoot kind of um, outdoor sports and they still don't really understand how light works. And I find that shooting film really forces you to have to understand and have a relationship with light and how it works. Um, and also in, in learning it, I think you end up also enjoying kind of shooting it more, you know. Um, but I, I see what you're saying, that there are a lot of shots where I wouldn't be happy with imperfections. Like if, I've, I've got shots that I adore that have huge light leaks going through them, uh, which I haven't shown you here, but if I had a light leak on this one, I would have been utterly heartbroken. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's the truth. Um, and yes, in terms of... Um, see if I can, yeah, I can see it kind of pretty well there. Um, yeah, the shoulder is what sold it to me. This is, yeah, the shoulder is, for me, 50% of the reason why I chose this image. There's something else, because the shoulder just means to me that she stopped caring about how she's looking. She's so in the moment that that's dropped. And you can imagine, you, you know, you, you women, you girls that are here, if you're kind of like somewhere and you wear your dress and that drops, you quickly put it back up again because you, you don't want to give that off, you know, but there she's dropped it and she's kind of like, I'm rolling with this, but I'm so in the moment. And I think that's what I liked about that. Um, and also her stare is a lot more intense than in the others. The others are more like playful. This one is kind of a lot more intense. Like she's really just been interrupted. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I but I'm glad you spotted it, the shoulder. But, but it turns back again and starts to your would have to slow things down and burn a couple of yeah. getting the right thing out. It's quite interesting how you end up. End up, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. I mean, it's, but this one is quite good to slow it down as well. I mean, there wasn't a problem. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have, um, 
and we weren't rushing for anything specific. We could take our time, so it was okay. There are some shoots that we would do better with digital. Um, but I think for this one, it's a one shot that I definitely think that it looks better on film, especially medium format film. Um, um, so, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I love these images, by the way. It reminds me of uh, Hopper. Yeah, Edward Hopper, yeah. yeah. I, I, I did get a lot of that. I, I mean, in all fairness, like, I do have Nighthawks hanging over my, um, my, um, my table light in, the, um, in our living room. But to be honest with you, when I shot this, I, 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 I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like, I, I would happily tell you all my influences. I, Edward Hopper never came into this, like, not once. But then when, a pe when people began to tell me that, I was like, of course, it's Edward Hopper. <laughs> it's obviously Edward Hopper, isn't it? You can't deny it. Um, and I can totally see that, um, absolutely. It's the darkness, the light, the shadow, um, the space as well that you give. Um, this one, maybe not so much, but the other ones certainly have a lot more space. That you know, There's a lot more space here. Um, and I prefer the other image as well because it gives you more texture here, so it gives it a slightly more old school effect, which lends itself more to the Edward Hopper. This Edward Hopper, I think, his paintings are based in 1950s America, 40s America. So, um, but yeah, I can, I, can totally, I can totally see that. Um, but I would, love to, I would love to tell you that it was influenced by Hopper, but it actually wasn't. It was actually influenced by the location of the zone completely. <laughs> yeah. I think that is a feeling of from the 50s, it's down to the USA. And actually, I mean, I, I would like you to continue with this, but absolutely to, as you were saying, this, this, yeah. to, yeah, to like, maybe establish a series with uh, yeah. different moments in and about the nation. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's 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 very much about the woman as well. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, you know, I always I always think that sometimes I'm coming across as sexist or something or like making women look beautiful or whatever. Women are just not there to look beautiful, right? You know, and, and I totally get that. But these are my images, you know, and you know I'm a man, and you know I find women attractive, you know, so. I'm not going to deny myself these things, you know, I think for me these are quite instinctual things, you know, and I, I don't want to deny myself that instinct um, of finding a look by a woman that's very intense, kind of like, you know, enjoyable, you know, um, but it's very much about the woman and it's kind of almost empowering the woman as well, I think, you know, I don't like, there's a lot of images that I took of, um, an image that I showed you of Alicia where she looked too vulnerable and I didn't enjoy that. Um, I just I just capture her at the wrong moment and she looked vulnerable and I and those are not the kind of images that I like you know I like to I like a woman to be almost kind of be a bit more empowered you know um, not weak um, not giving herself up to anything it's it's a slightly different vibe for me um, so I'm very careful with what the image gives to me so I don't make things look like that and I'm, sort of, I'm very careful in examining it um, yeah. Actually, I was going to ask something, which is, um, you mentioned that you were, you started with the video, don't you? Mm. Are you still doing video? And if yes, if this, uh, you know, everything you're doing with still images is affecting the way you do video nowadays? Um, in terms of framing, in terms of light, in terms of tone? I mean, I would say that, I mean, um, I mean, I know a lot of people that do work in the video industry, um, and I kind, of, I kind of wish that they would actually take up photography a lot more because it teaches you so much about framing um, things, you know, because you become so at one with your viewfinder and certainly you're taking pictures of almost nothing, you know. Whereas a lot of people that I know that work in video, they're kind of working in TV or very fast-paced environments where they're literally just pointing a camera at something and hope to get the action, you know, or, you know, marrying an image to someone talking, you know, and that's, that that's becomes important. Um, to kick me out. Oh, there we go. No, that's, there we go. Um, so I, I, I find that it has affected uh, my work in that I don't care that much for it anymore. <laughs> um, but it's not that I don't care. I think for me, like I said earlier on, I think for me the zenith of what I want to do or where I want to go is very much still in cinematography. You know, um, I don't necessarily mind giving myself up to a director or whoever, to a storyteller, to bring a story to life, but it has to be right, otherwise I have no interest whatsoever. Um, 
I mean, I, I've worked in, I've worked a little bit in TV, you know, um, I've done a lot of corporate work, and it's just not for me, you know. Don't get me wrong, it pays the bills, you know, but it's not, for me, it's not fun. Um, you know, when I was younger, I would have been like, hey, you know, I work in TV, or hey, you know, I just do a video, but now I just don't care. I just don't want to waste my time anymore. So th I think for me to get involved with projects, they have to be right. Because this is so important to me now, it's, it's hard for me to cheapen it anymore. So, um, but um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but um, I think certainly it's ha it has, I think it's, it has helped me a lot if I were to go that route with cinematography. I think, I think so. I think it's done a lot for, for that and, and my, my understanding of light as well um, and composition, more importantly, and studying the right things within the frame, like faces. Um, edges of frame. I think I forget what was said, but sometimes the edges of the frame are more interesting than something when they're what's in the center. So it's often looking at everything around to see how that kind of plays. Um, how often and how much do you experiment with film? Uh, with type of film? Um, so you have mentioned um, Verani, you have mentioned Expire film, you have mentioned Portrait. Mm. Um, I actually don't shoot Portrait that much. I think Portrait is the one that I shoot for night, but I experiment a lot. A lot. At the moment, I'm in love with expired slide film, <laughs> which is, is it's kind of hard. I mean, slide film is very difficult because slide slide film has a very low exposure latitude. So you know, if you think of you know a Sony A7S, for example, it has an exposure latitude of 14 stops. So within 14 stops, you will always have you know detail in highlight and shadow. You know, slide film has like seven stops. So you have to really nail your exposure correctly to get it right. And, when you can't see your results in a viewfinder, sorry, on an LCD, you do, you're under pressure a lot. But I, I, I love the look of it, um, the resolution as well, um, but the colours that it gives, it just gives an otherworldly vibe, um, especially when, when you shoot it the right way. I mean, I can, I can very quickly show you an example of some slide film that I shot. This, is, this was shot in Cuba. Um, <coughs> so it's quite a close-up. Um, but like I said, you know, like if it was anything else, there'd be a lot more detail in this shadow here. Um, but because it's slide, you have to meter for your highlights always to get that exposure to come out properly. Um, and in terms of a look, it just creates a really strange kind of kind of look as well. You know, really saturated, but not overly so. It's just a very otherworldly kind of look to 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 the to to the to what you're shooting basically. So yeah, so I experiment a lot, but always with a view to settle on specific things. So I think I know what my black and white is, so I, I can put that aside. Um, I know what my daylight film is, so I can put that aside. Um, and I'm still thinking about what my nighttime um, and all purposes. I'm not really sure as to what those are yet. So I'm still very much experimenting with nighttime shots and, um, and all purpose, so 400 speed films and stuff. It's just it's just ongoing <laughs> and just shelling up more and more money basically so but it's, it's all right it's it, I mean sometimes you do get amazing results and it's, it's worth it and that's kind of what you're constantly edging towards that that result that you want I think yeah thanks a lot